welcome to Sports Management Podcast, where you will hear interesting sports management professionals share their stories, experiences, and passion for the sports management industry. I am your host, Marcus Philipsson. Today's guest is Dr. Erkut Sogut, the founding partner of Football Agent Institute. Dr. Sogut is a sports lawyer, author, lecturer, life coach, keynote speaker, and a sports agent with clients like Kieran Gibbs and Mesut Özil. In 2018, Dr. Sogut negotiated the biggest Premier League contract to date and did the same thing again in 2021 in the Turkish League. He has a passion for teaching and learning, which has led him to start Football Agent Institute, where he trains up-and-coming agents. He has also written several books, and you have the chance to win one of them, called How to Become a Football Agent, The Guide. Check out my Instagram tomorrow, October 11th. It's Sports M Podcast for more information. Get ready to learn how to become a sports lawyer, why he only wanted to work 50% as an agent, about his passion for learning and teaching, his best advice for young people in the sports industry, and much more. Dr. Erkut Sogud, welcome to Sports Management Podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Marcus. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm doing well. So it's Monday. So the week starts, right? So, but in, in my world, there's no really weekend or week. So I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I was just a couple of days away then, and I'm back since last night, back to work here in Orange County in California. Mm, that's great. The weather good? Yeah, it's always good. It's one of the reasons I moved to this part of the world, I would say. After being born and raised in Germany and then lived nearly 10 years in London, I said, maybe trying out something with better weather. So yeah, it was one of the reasons. I mean, it's always nice, to be honest. It's, it's one of the good things here. Sounds like a good choice. Yeah, so you said that you're busy and I mean, you're doing so many things. You are a sports lawyer, you're a sports agent, you're an author, lecturer, life coach, keynote speaker, you name it. So uh, can you tell us a little bit of what you do in the sports industry? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm someone who always wants to develop himself, like uh, myself, if developing my my personality, my work and everything. That's why I do so many things, I would say. I always am hungry for more knowledge, for, you know, to make myself better and to be competitive out there. So, and I always wanted to become a teacher. That's when you go back high school time. I always said, look, I want to become a teacher. I love teaching. I, I'm very passionate about uh, uh, making someone else better through teaching. And the process of teaching was always something I loved. And I was always teaching at school younger students, right? It was always giving them, you know, for their homework, it was helping and everything. But uh, yeah, but my parents didn't want me to become a teacher at the time. Or let's say my dad wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor. So I had to choose like uh, between them two. But I said, okay, I become a lawyer and I do my academic career at university and do my master's. And in different countries, I've done master's. I've done, I graduated from law school in Germany. Uh, eventually, I've done a PhD in sports law, the field which I love to teach, especially. But this teaching brought me into the world of becoming an agent. It wasn't; it was uh, not intentionally. It was uh, helping out others. If you're very good in what you do, if you're very professional and very unique in what you do and what you can deliver, other doors will open in life. And I think that happened. Kind of, I really focus on what I can do very well, which is teaching, educating. And I started teaching agents as well in the business. Like 15 years ago when I started, there was no one teaching agents. And that opened me door to many family members of football players. And they asked me, hey, Eric, would you like to help with this contract? Can you become the lawyer of my son? Oh, actually, you should be the agent of my son. I said, no, I just want to be a professor. I'm moving on to become a professor. But eventually, I had to take a break and become an agent, and uh, which I've done for years and years in Europe. And I built my own team there on uh, on the ground in Europe. Uh, fantastic young agents, which I taught myself again, teaching. So all of them uh, went through my hands. They were all my students. Now they're all agents and they're running the business, literally. So I made the move to over the big uh, sea uh, to United States. So I can pursue a little bit more my educational career to become a professor, finally. So, uh, yeah, so I'm someone who loves uh, teaching, writing, Writing novels is uh, always, again, it's a way of sharing knowledge, you know. It's a way of becoming a, a, a teacher through writing, right? And sharing knowledge in a different way, through telling stories in football, through a novel. Fictional stories, but factual things in it, you know. That's uh, something I love to share. It's all actually focused around teaching. 
and sharing knowledge and speaking, being a keynote speaker, being a mentor to someone. Again, it's also being a teacher, right? And having a young player you look after when the player is 16, 17, 18, you teach them, kind of, you mentor them, right? It's all connected. That's why I love doing it. And yeah, that's a little bit myself. I have two little boys. One is a five-year-old and one is seven months old. Uh, and my wife, uh, we live here together in California. We moved over. My wife is from England. So as I said, I'm born and raised in Germany, but I have Turkish heritage. I'm a mix of everything. I think Turkish, German, English, and now this American comes into me. So happy living here. And again, I'm hungry to learn. Just gave a guest lecture at Ohio State University last week. It was fantastic. Oh, my goal is to become a professor at Harvard University. So that, that's the goal. Yeah, That's where I'm heading to. You are the founding partner of Football Agent Institute. Was that the team that you were referring to before? Yeah, no, the Football Agent Institute is because the agency world is not really professional organized. There are no professional regulations for agents. And even now, we still don't, you know, agents are not regulated, to be honest. Like, it's uh, every country does it by themselves. Since 2015, there are no regulations. FIFA gave it to the countries, and every country is doing something else. Whereas FIFA is now going back and wants to centralize it again and have certain regulations for all the agents worldwide. But I wanted to create something, an, an institute where we can teach, where we can deliver a message, where we can teach the future agents. And so we have done that years and years ago when we started. Now FIFA and UEFA created also agents programs so to teach upcoming agents. You know, uh, I mean, it's also good money making for them, I guess, as well. So they're now teaching also agents. So I was doing that like years and years ago because that was that was necessary, you know. And you hear a lot of bad things about agents, right? There are bad agents, but they're also very good agents. They work hardworking, really doing their job, trying to do the best for their clients and to push them and to help them and to people who wants to make it really nicely good. We needed some more educated agents, you know. And I think I somehow created that a little bit, professionalized the market with good young agents, which I have all over the world, which I had an input into their uh, career of becoming an agent. You have worked in the business for 20 years. You have had it 10 years as a full-time job. And you have worked as an agent for, I mean, some of the best players in the world, including Mesut Özil and Kieran Gibbs. So how did you get there from the beginning? I mean, following my passion, again, it's it all comes back to my teaching and education. I was teaching agents at the time. Uh, and uh, when the father of Mesut Özil called me and asked me if I would be happy to teach their employees in Germany, in Düsseldorf, in the office, there were like seven, eight people working at the time. And I said, yeah, I can do that once a month. I can fly. I was just doing my second master's in Istanbul at the time. And I was flying once a month over to Germany and teaching all the employees about contracts, image rights, social media, PR, marketing, everything an agent should need to learn. And that's how it started. I was just teaching. I, I never thought about being an agent uh, for the son. And But six months later, they asked me if I want to become the lawyer of the son. And I finished my master's and I was heading back to Germany to start my PhD. And I, and I started as a part-time. I said I was a part-time lawyer of Mesut Özil, so he was playing with Real Madrid at the time, and uh, part-time uh, and a PhD student. I was living both worlds all the time. And, but that was the agreement. I said, look, I can't work full-time lawyer for him because I want to be a professor, you know. I don't I don't mind if a player plays for Real Madrid, Juventus, or Man United. I don't care where they play. You know, I have my own career. I need to follow my passion. They, they quite liked it. So I had to go to Madrid, actually, to meet Mesut and agree on a part-time lawyer job, you know, so they were looking for a full-time. So that's, uh, uh, eventually they agreed on it and then I became his uh, lawyer uh, and I was like, I was living both world two, three days a lawyer, the rest of the week and the weekend I was a student in the library and researching and working on my PhD. So it was a very interesting time for me. But again, uh, one year later, the family asked me to become the agent, full-time agent. And I was like, I didn't even think about I was like, how will I finish my PhD? I was like, uh, I can't do it. Part-time agent. So again, we made an agreement. I was part-time as agent and part-time I was a student. So I was living both worlds. And I've done it for a while like that. And until I finished my PhD, then I moved to uh, England back 2013, 14, and lived there nearly eight, nine years or so, like nearly 10 years, actually. Oh, yeah. And uh, at the time when I moved to England, I kind of stopped a little bit more the teaching part. So because I've done my master's, my doctor-in-law, and I said, okay, now I knew I will not do that my whole life, uh, being an agent in terms of as a full-time job. I said, I need to build a team. 
right? That was the most important thing. I realized, okay, if you want to create an agency, you need to start teaching agents within in your team. And hundreds of young aspiring agents came throughout the time into my office. Some worked for, for a while with me or for me and left. And But now I have a team there where I could say, I'm leaving, guys. So I have an agent in England. I have an agent in Belgium, in Austria, in Switzerland, in Germany, and in Turkey on the ground young agents and one of them is a ceo the one in austria thomas is his name so i left it kind of i'm still working with them i have zoom calls every monday with them i have phone calls every day with them it's not that i left but i kind of created a team who can look after clients in europe and i said okay i'm going now to us i still want to work in football here in the mls i want to create relationship and everything but the educational part will take over slowly so now is probably Let's say 80% is being an agent and 20% is a teacher. But eventually in one, two years, it will be 50-50. And it will become one day, hopefully 80% being a teacher, but 20% being an agent. I think I need both to be a good teacher. I think the best teachers are the ones who are still working in the practical world. You know, I had professors in my life. They never worked outside in the world. They were always at the university in a comfort zone. They don't know how it is outside there, right? They just teach everything from the book, theoretical. And I think the good professors, the good teachers in future are who have access to both sides, you know, over the academic side, but also the practical side. And that's what you can teach and make someone really good as a student. And that's my goal, to deliver for the students, the future talent managers, talent agents. We can't even call it a soccer agent or football or basketball. The future will be talent representatives or talent managers. That's what it is. Yeah, I completely agree with you and uh, very interesting. So. You're talking a lot about the passion for you want to be a professor at Harvard, but I mean, you have done so many things as a lawyer and an agent. You have negotiated the biggest Premier League contract in the history for uh, one of your clients. And three years later, you did it again in Turkish football. What are some key learnings from these milestones? I mean, it's everything is learning, right? I feel like if you negotiate a deal, you don't actually think about this will become the biggest deal or you just try to get the best out for your client. You know, who you who do you represent? If it's a player, then you need to get best for the player. If it's a coach, you need to get for best. If it's a club, you need to work, then you do for the club. And I try always to put my client first, right? This is my, all, all, I never talk about myself or what I will earn or what I will get out of commission, never. Until I negotiated everything for my client, then I start talking about myself, right? And it says, okay, what's paid for my services? Whereas a lot of agents go the other way around. They would say, hey, if I bring you this player, how much is my commission, right? So, and I think for the agents who are out listening, maybe want to become an agent, put always your client first and give them the best service or him or her, whatever you represent, you know, could be female, male, athlete, but try to make the best, you know, day in, day out. So give everything. Don't say that's enough. There's never good enough. You know, I never believe in, okay, that's that's good. That doesn't exist. Like you need to get the best for your client, the best contract, the best image right deal, the best contract for the playing on the field, the best bonuses. And it's negotiation. It's, it's learning. You know, if you ask me, like, how did you negotiate that? I learned it while doing it. So it, they, they, there is no tool or a university or someone teaches you how to negotiate the best deal in the Premier League. It's about giving your best in like and everything else in life. If you give your best in what you do, the outcome, the results are very good, you know? So if you create a podcast and do like day in, day out and give not 100, 200%, right? Then it will be successful. It's very simple. And then when you get better than other podcasts, it's, it's really putting in that effort and making it with love and passion to get your clients the best out of it. I think that's what I always do. For me, the younger clients are more important than the older ones, to be honest. I, the people ask me that if a young player makes become first professional, contract with 17 18 that satisfies me more if a 30 years old getting the best contract in the world right because that what you you have such an effect to a career of a young player is massive like you change their lives in terms of the next stage you know and for the family i think that's more like something i love and makes give me the passion as well you know because you teach them as well there's a teaching effect with young players are more than with older ones right so yeah, going back to your passion to teach again. Yes, you see? It all, <laughs> it all comes back to teaching. Yes. Now when you're in the States and you said that you're working a little bit with MLS, trying to make connections there, can you see a big difference in how the soccer industry is in the US versus Europe? 
Yeah, I mean, um, I'm following this market for the last 10 years. I'm coming and going a lot. So I've been probably four or five times a year been in US before. Like I was always coming to Soccer X in Miami to the exhibition to meet people. But I was going also to places like Denver, LA, Boston, New York, Miami, just to meet clubs, meet people, watch games, you know, just to understand. And I was coming every year. And I've seen literally in these 10 years how big MLS become and how fast it was kind of growing. People are saying, oh, the MLS, will it make it? It is already there, right? It's already big. They're selling now players for 10 million from Chicago to uh, Chelsea. We wouldn't even think about that. An MLS player goes for 10 million, 15 million, 20 million. And they're buying players for 7, 8, 10 million. And they're creating such a great talent here. It's unbelievable. It's such a big country, right? It's bigger than Europe in terms of the opportunity. And I personally believe, Marcus, after the World Cup 2026, right, it will be the second best football country in the world. So it will be number one Premier League, number two, latest in 2028 with the Olympic Games. So we have 2026, the World Cup, then maybe Women World Cup. I don't know if it's 2027, but then the Olympic Games will be here in Los Angeles, 2028, again, football. And I think with that, because if I compare the MLS today with the other leagues, I mean, Premier League is Premier League. That's the non plus ultra. It's very like the best league in Europe by far, right? No other league is coming close to the Premier League. If you go to the other leagues, and most of them are financially in, 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 in trouble. Even a club like Barcelona is selling their future, future, future rights to certain companies just to make transfers, right? They're unhealthy clubs in terms of finances, very unhealthy. And uh, you, you go, you said you started in Greece. Yep. You know how unhealthy Greece football is or Turkey, they're all under debt. Yep. They just plan the debt for the next year and for the next 20 years, the debt with the bank will be refinance, refinance, refinance. We're talking about clubs in debt, unhealthy, very bad mismanagement. So, And then if you go a little bit higher than these, like let's say France, Germany, there are one or two clubs, you know, which are interesting. In Germany, you would watch once a year Bayern Munich against Dortmund. The rest you wouldn't even watch, right? It's uninterest. It's not interesting because Bayern Munich is winning for the last 10 years the league or 12 years. Same, you have France. It's always PSG. It's no one interested in the French league. Italy, financial trouble, huge, right? And Spain, as I said, also a problem. But America is growing healthy. Every year, they're adding into it new stadiums, new training facilities, and the ownership is growing. So the money is growing. They have a salary, minimum salary, right? It's a, it's around $80,000 if you become an MLS. Player. So again, even there's a protection, right? You don't have that in Europe. So there's still a long way to go. But eventually, if you see it as a league, as a whole league, Look, you have an LA two teams. LAFC is a fantastic team. Amazing stadium. You, a lot of uh, European standard, better than European standards. You go to Atlanta, the Mercedes-Benz area, it's massive, like 60, 70,000 full. You go to Seattle, amazing soccer uh, stadium, amazing soccer fans. You have the same in Minnesota. And then you go to New York, two teams. So you're Florida, you go to Miami, Orlando, Austin, Dallas. There's huge cities huge potential and followership and growing every day. And this kind of, the big picture, you don't have that in Europe. The only place it will compete will be England. And I think the second best league will be, sooner or later, will be the MLS. So it, there is no other way. Yeah, you might be right. That would be incredible considering that a couple of years ago, MLS was the league where players went to retire more or less, like Beckham went and then Slatan went, Ibrahimovic, but then he didn't retire. But that's what <laughs> most people thought. Yeah. And uh, now, I mean, with a new broadcasting deal with Apple and uh, as you said, also like with the professionalism surrounding the league. So, yeah, it will be very interesting to, to follow. Yeah. Going back to the agent work. You obviously help them with contracts and, you know, legal matters, but uh, you also help them with some off-pitch ventures. And if we take Özil, for example, he has the seventh largest social media following of active football players. So are you helping the players with, I mean, these type of things, how to manage their social media, how to talk to the press and so forth? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, it changed so much, you know, it, the play is more in focus, Marcus. We are living in a in an era where uh, it's not about anymore the club that much than it was, right? To be honest, it's more about the player now. Fans going to watching more the players and not the clubs. It's changing, it's shifting towards the player. Clubs won't like that, but it is what it is. It will become more like the American model. 
you have in America, you talk about the NBA, the NFL, they're players' league. They're not clubs' league. They talk more about the player. Focus. Yes, the club is there, but the players become stars, and social media made them star, made them their own brand and stars. If you want it, if, if they like it or not, they have their own media, so, so to say. And if you look after your own media very well, you have something to say. You can share it with the whole world. There's no limit. That didn't exist before. Players' voices were not out there. Only the clubs could talk to the media, the normal media we have. And that was the way, you know, through interviews. But today, players are becoming more brands. Players becoming more important, right? Players have a voice. Also, even political things has changed so much. It's drifted. So I think players are more focused. And if you manage a player very well from a young age, building the social media, the marketing, PR, everything around it, later on, you will see the results three, four, five years later, right? You can't have the results tomorrow. That's why I say to some young players, when they say, look, social media is important, but, you know, too much is also not good, you know? But on, on the other hand, I always work with experts for all players. Like if it's about social media, I work with an agency. There's an, an agency in Munich. It's called Replay Forward. For every player on a certain level, they have to work with that agency in terms of they'll take care of PR, marketing, social media. So it's covered. So I'm, I'm like the one who guides it more, you understand? So I'm like the one, if I go to the deal in Italy, I would take an Italian lawyer, a friend of mine, into the deal. So just to give the player more security, more knowledge, and protect myself and the player. So it's, uh, it's, it's important for an agent to manage a player. A player is like a company, like a holding. Imagine a holding, and under the holding, there are Dota companies, or like or Dota play, like I call it like places like social media, marketing, uh, finances, and everything else. You need to be good in doing that. You need to guide your player into the right direction. If it's nutrition, if it's, it's, if it's another physio, if it's, you know, whatever they need. You need to work on that and build around the player, the team. Just give you an example. For one of my players, uh, I just arranged the uh, sports psychologist. So how do you have this discussion? Because I realize he needs one. But how do you tell him? You, you need to, they say, oh, I'm not, uh, I'm not mentally sick or whatever. That's the reaction. I don't need the sports psychologist. I don't know. Wait, look. Have one, have one talk, half an hour. I'll be there to Zoom first and then personally. And then you, you decide. If you don't like it, you don't like it. But then what happened is after the first session, hey, actually, that was quite nice. That helped me to talk about things I never talked before. And this mental awareness, mental issues becoming more important, the pressure. You need to build around to play at this team. And social media is one of them and very important to build another also income stream for a player. You can monetize it and make income for the player. And also, if you have a big followership, if you go to a club, the club will look at that and say, oh, they have, this player has 10 million followers, five on Twitter, three on YouTube, whatever. And the club will monetize the player's social media for their own brands. So there's a value. And that's why a player can earn more money. So that's why when I brokered Mesut Ozil's deal in 2018, people said, why is he earning so much? People don't realize he earns so much because of his off-the-pitch value. The commercial deals he was bringing in, the reach, he had more reach than the club. So that's important for a club to have that you know, to have that streaming into it, the, the, the club brands, and to use it. You know, you have a platform you can sell to a club. Imagine that you create the social media platform. You go to, again, also for a sponsor, you go to a sponsor and says, hey, Adidas, Nike, Puma, you want to have my player? Yes, you would pay 100000 a year, but if you want to use my player's social media, you add another 50000 grand a year because, and then you can say exactly what kind of reach you have, which age group, male, female, countries, cities, languages, everything. And that's a value. Data is value there. So you need to create that value for the player and it helps also for after the career. Yeah, for sure. I find it interesting that you uh, you are outsourcing some of the aspects of the, of the management. And uh, you said also you work with a lawyer in Italy, if I heard you right. And I mean, you are a lawyer yourself. So why wouldn't you have that in-house? Why would you outsource that? A very simple because law in every country is different. So, so employment law. So, what we're doing in the end, we do contracts, right? I have a PhD in sports law, but that that doesn't mean I'm more knowledgeable than a lawyer about employment law in Spain or in Italy or in Greece. They're on the ground daily, and they know the law daily, and things changing quickly in law. They are up to date. They need to say, okay, there's a new tax clause in the law that means the players pay three percent more tax but whatever right or certain contracts in certain countries can be longer than five years like in spain 
or if you sign in the Basque region in Spain, you have less tax than if you sign in Madrid or in Seville. So these things, the, the, you need to have that wide that network of good lawyers you can work with together to provide. Look, a lot of agents don't do that. They would say, oh, that cost me extra money. I just take the commission. But I, again, what I said in the beginning, always put your client first. Get your client the best service you can, right? The best, best service with the best lawyers in every country you go, with the best tax experts, because it will pay back. In, uh, the money you pay for that service pays you back. Your client, you have done a good job, will bring you two more clients. Because your client is your business card. It's not yourself. The one you look after will represent you, actually. That's what not many agents understand. They say, oh, I don't want to get as much as commission for myself in my pocket. Done. I just done the deal. Gone. And I don't care about the player. But if they would have think the other way around, let's do the best deal for my client. Let's get a most of for my client. That client is in the dressing room every day with every other player. And, and players talk with each other. And one of the players will say, oh, my agent's not very good. And my player will say, hey, my agent done a fantastic job here. Maybe you should have talked to him. And that's how you that's how your reputation is growing. That's how you get clients and they come to you. But that takes time. You need to build that over years. You need to be patient. That's why I tell young agents always, you know, you need to be patient. Until I like I said it took me like probably 10 years to be established being an established agent. What do you expect in two years that you make millions and run the show? That doesn't exist. Like I try to tell them like. It takes time to build, to get clients, to make mistakes, to build up and again. So it's just a process they have to follow on. That's uh, so interesting, and I agree with you. Sounds like you want to become an agent now. <laughs> yes, you definitely. You, <laughs> you make a very good case for it, that's for sure. And uh, I laughed a little bit because um, you mentioned employment law, and uh, it's you are the third sports lawyer that tells me the same thing now, that uh, if you are a lawyer who wants to become a sports lawyer take a class on employment law because that's essentially what you're working with yes yes definitely this episode is sponsored by in sport education the online business school for sport they offer a range of different courses for example foundations of sport business private equity in sport and much much more as a listener to this podcast you get 10 percent off all of their courses using the code sports management podcast 10 click the link in the description below and sign up today you also have something called the football agent masterclass what is that yeah i have created throughout the time different opportunities for students to to learn right and one of the things was some of the students couldn't come or live in parts of the world and i and i, and I wanted to create something with my team which is affordable and which is you know something for them to learn. And the Football Asia Masterclass is a six-week online course. It's just online. It's six weeks, but they get a one-to-one with me as well, every student. It's uh, more than my book, How to Become a Football Agent, which I've written. This 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 one is more in-depth, gives them really like all the input and all the information. If they really consider to become an agent, this could be the first step, so to say. And um, I don't know if it's five hundred dollar or seven hundred dollar, something like that. I'm not hundred percent sure actually. It was between something like the students, I think five hundred dollar, and if you're not student, you pay seven hundred fifty dollar or something like that. But the value is really like the six week course and get the depth inside. And I got really good feedback on that from the students. And some of them, two of them, are working now with me as an agent, right, in my team. Oh yeah, yeah. So look, it's simple. If I get students, they're really good. I don't let them go, right? I'm not stupid. So that's that's what I felt like. And one of them was a, a former football player from Belgium. And uh, uh, he is now our Belgium agent in my team. So Niels. And uh, one of them is from England. And uh, he is now, uh, he was a student at the time. He is now studying law on top. And he's now a UK guy. So, and uh, so again, you see like actually that tool of educating others and giving them an opportunity actually widens my team. And if I get someone in my, on my course from uh, Denmark or in future from Norway, and I've seen, wow, a very good agent, I'll make them part of my team. Why would I let them go? Like, that's the Football Agent Masterclass. But I'm really, actually, right now, I created a different course. I don't know if you heard about that, the How to Become a Football Agent. This is like a proper one-to-one uh, with, with session with me once a week. 
and with a session with uh, someone from the industry because that's the next step. Someone is, okay, really serious. I made the decision. I want to become a football agent, right? And uh, I want to invest into it and I want to really learn. I want to meet people because one of the biggest difficulties in our network is meeting the right people, right? And building relationship and moving on because that's what a lot of young agents have to go over it, you know? And, and I said, okay, I, I need to create another course, the next step, which is for them to really have one to week with me. And I follow them three months every week. And after that, they will be still in these alumni classes with the guest lectures. It goes always. They, so they never leave me, actually. So they start with me three months uh, every week. And then they will be like every year in March till May and October, uh, sorry, September till December. They will use this uh, weekly courses with guest lectures. Let's say a scout from West Ham United, a director in football in Austria, Vienna, former football players, right? So they uh, a marketing guy. So they will get them into these talks and but it's very selective i'm not taking anyone into that one because i'll just take 10 for the first course right that's it and i close the door and i want to take maybe next year 15 right just to because i want to give them the best service you know the 10 the one i teach they'll get the one-to-one with me into my network into my team and i need to introduce them to people because i can't introduce everyone to my network you know they must be serious people is go to like a double interview first with one of my team members and then with the final interview with me and if they're good enough then i take them onto the course that's great an earlier guest on this podcast is uh, daniel g and i've seen that uh, oh. you are doing something together with him and jesse engelhardt right yes yes we do the football agent business summit together and uh, we have done it i mean daniel g we do years and years things together he's a fantastic lawyer in england uh, one of the best sports lawyers i've ever met uh, if someone needs a sports lawyer, I think he is the right person, uh, one of the right persons, especially in England, but also in Europe. He's very, and also a good human being, you know, not just being an age, uh, not being a good lawyer, also a good human. That's character. I think that's when he wins, you know, clients. He's a very good person. He was my neighbor, actually, in London. We were living like five minutes walking distance from each other and uh, good friend, neighbor, and good partner. We have, we have given together lessons with Daniel G in Mumbai, India in Miami and different parts of the world. We have started the Football Agent Business Summit together with Daniel and also Jesse and others. We we want to make it like uh, better and bigger. And this year we'll be all in London. So at the weekend 12, 13, in, or 11, 12 November, we'll be all in London. And that's also another opportunity for everyone to meet us. We all three and some other guests from the football industry will be in London and giving a two days uh, summit for someone who is interested in becoming a sports lawyer or becoming a football agent or want to work in uh, sports in generally. So anyone can come literally. And yeah, I look forward again. These meetings also, I meet a lot of people to build relationship for myself as well. Good, right? Over the years, I've done this. And now I know people from different parts of the world because of the summit. So if someone is interested, in meeting a sports lawyer, uh, Daniel G, another sports lawyer, Jesse from Spain, and me, slash lawyer, but more agent, I would say. So please uh, come to London that weekend. Uh, we'd love to meet uh, students and aspiring agents, and well, also agents who are agent there or lawyer, but you just want to create more network, you know. Do you need to buy tickets? Yes, if you go to Football Agent Business Summit on uh, Instagram, uh, on the page uh, you will find it uh, it's very simple and uh, there's a link you click on the link and then you buy the tickets and you can also buy a daily ticket just for the one day saturday or the sunday it depends what the students like and yeah i got already like i have uh, someone here a student in la who just fly over for that right so uh, yeah we have people from all over the world like from australia uh, africa uh, of course europe different parts so it's quite nice it's good for networking for the students or for the participants with each other as well you know with the others because that's how they create network you know for the future we have talked a lot about teaching and that uh, i'm sure that you are a role model to so many young up-and-coming sports lawyers and agents but have you had any role models in your career it's a very good question i think my role model was my mom i think uh in terms of hard working sacrificing and uh my mom and dad, the Turkish immigrants, you you in Sweden, you know immigrate immigrants a lot. You've seen her as well. 
it's no non educated in terms of not money to go to school you know so they're coming from very tough backgrounds they came to work to germany to have a better life and my mom went 30 years cleaning you know so and i i've seen her in the mornings when she was waking up 334 to go cleaning and i've seen it in more and i always said my mom is my role model for that mom i'll become the best son you know i, I will study hard I'll achieve big goals to make her proud that when she is somewhere they say, okay, that's the mom of Perkut, you know, she's, she can be proud. And I think my mom was my role model, like always, she really drive me. My, my, my dad, of course, too, but mom, mom is different, you know, I always say mom, like I say three times mom. And then I say dad, but maybe my own two kids would do the same, but that would be bad for me. But mom is different. I don't know. The mom is mom, you know, it's, it's how it is. Any role model from inside the industry? Um, I mean, there are some professors I quite like, like Professor Peter Cafani at Harvard. He's a uh, sports law, uh, professor, but also someone who researched and done a lot in the representation side of athletes. So I was in his class three, four years ago in Whitehead, and I gave also guest lectures at Harvard Business School. So Peter Cafani is probably one of the professors I look you know, up to and want to learn from. And always wanted to, but other than that, there's no really, you know. I always, I always compete with myself, kind of, and always I'm angry about myself if I'm not doing well. So if I if I haven't learned Spanish today, for example, I'll be angry with myself, right? So I say, okay, you haven't done today. So even if I'm bad and late night, I need to do the 20 minute Spanish on my phone. Just like I always compete with myself, I always want to get the better of myself. I love motivational videos as well. People sometimes say, Eric, you don't need motivation. I say, yes, I do. I need motivation every day. So like you guys, I need moti- I need to motivate myself as well. So always keep going on, keep moving. I like reading about people who achieve big things. I like Warren Buffett a lot and love his ethics of working hard, reading about you know, how Warren Buffett reads about business before he buys business. That's why I'm trying to read about clubs. And I tell my agents, you need to know everything about clubs. The finances, people working there, what's their strategy? You need to learn and you need to really uh, read all about it. You know, all the information you can get before you approach a club. You know, I think these kind of people uh, I quite like, yeah, quite look up to. What's your motivational inspiration? Is it like David Goggins things or? Oh, I mean, anything. Denzel Washington too, you know, there's no really like, I have some of them saved, you know, it depends what I'm what i need i would say <laughs> and then i go into my notes you know and the links of the youtube videos are saved there, and then i click on it and this is about like this you know i need that motivation now and i put it on and especially in the morning hours i do it because i wake up very early i'm a 5 five thirty early bird so some people wake up late i can't the only time i wake up late is when i'm very late go to bed because i have to travel or whatever But other than that, I have a routine in life. I wake up between 5 and 5.30 every morning and then go down to the kitchen area, sit down, make my coffee, and then have a dog, a Labrador. I go for a walk with my dog. So that's the time when I kind of meditate, think about the day, what's the goals, what's the tasks. And you know, there's no one there, nothing disturbing you. And then that's also when I put my earphone and listen 15 minutes to a motivational thing out there, motivate yourself, then come home. And the day starts, you know, I do, you know, like, I think I I need that. I'm someone with routine. I think consistency, whatever you do in life, is very important. Definitely. What's your best advice for young people who wants to pursue a career in sports? First of all, I just said consistency and the passion for it. You know, if you do something you don't really like or love, you will never have the passion or you will never have something to become very good in it because you just do it for the money or you just do it for other reasons or you just do it because other people tell you. I know so many people there living this life of which they actually don't want, but it gives them comfort, you know, and uh, they're in this comfort zone. I tell them, get out of your comfort zone, you know, try out. Life is so short. We just live once. If you count in days, I just last, last week, I was just saying, how many days if I go until, let's say 90 or just 20,000 days left in my life? Like, it's a stupid way of thinking of me, but it's just days like it's like why would you waste your life doing something which you're not passionate about and which you love you know but but we are we love comfort that's the problem you know we're human beings we love and to be in, in this comfort zone where you have a certain amount of money every month you can pay your bills and go through this life the whole you know your whole entire life and then when you say wow why i have never tried this or that 
in my life. And I think they should just go for that. You know, they should go what they love, what they're passionate about. You know, uh, for me, it was teaching. I always wanted to become a professor. I followed my passion because my passion then brought me other things in life. It opened me to do become an agent, which I never had, you know, the goal. But my passion. So if you follow your passion, I think that passion will bring you other opportunities as well in life. So you never give up on that and do it consistently. You know, whatever you do, don't do just three days and just leave it or four days and then two days not and one days. It doesn't matter what it is. It's learning about something, learning a language, reading a book, whatever. Just do it. Make yourself, plan yourself the day, plan yourself a week, everything planned and organized and then just consistency. You know, and especially at the moment when you feel it's the most difficult, you will never make it. That's the time when you have to keep going on. Exactly. That's the time when you say, uh, okay, you don't give up, you know, you ex now, like now I have to look, I was never in the comfort zone in my life. I could have gone in comfort zone early when I was working for another agency. I was their guy in Turkey. And when I was doing my master's, they offered me a partner, but it, was, it wasn't that what I wanted to, right? I say, no, I have to follow my passion. It doesn't matter. Make a difference. I was working as a waiter for Starbucks and I was uh, uh, working for HM. I was doing everything just to keep up. My passion, I wouldn't mind doing that kind of work. People say, no, I'm not working as a waiter, you know, that's, that's bullshit. That's not my work, you know. I'm just, people are like, so if it, that's whatever it is to follow your passion, you have to sacrifice, you know, you have to go for it and take it. Have you had any bumps on the road in your career? Massive. <laughs> <laughs> This is a massive. The people just see the success story. They don't see like what's happened, right? I mean, The interesting part about when I started teaching agents is like I was doing my master's in Turkey and I was uh, financially not in a good position. I adapted Germany for the, you know, I needed to be from the government money to study because family money wasn't enough. And when I was in Turkey, I, I couldn't survive financially. Like I was like in a very difficult position. And uh, so I said, okay, I need to start uh, making private seminars and uh, weekend seminars to make money, right? Out of this, because I was in a difficult position, I needed to make money. I started teaching, like at the weekends, the seminars, and that's how Mesut Özil's father saw me. So, do you see the connection? So, I'm not in a comfort zone. I'm struggling. I need to make money, but I never uh, stop my passion of education. And more, uh, I always think about my PhD in Germany. So, I follow my passion, but at the same time, I'm struggling. But because of struggling, I creating other revenue income streams just to survive and that opens me other doors if you don't struggle if you don't have that you're not becoming creative if you're sitting in a comfort zone every day oh my life is nice today i got five at work to go to the gym watch football with my friends at the weekend i play soccer that's it that's like you're never out of the comfort you never be creative in your life if you don't really struggle in terms of you have to do something And I think, thanks God, I have these bad times in my life, which brought me to that what I am today. And if you don't feel it, if you don't suffer into in, uh, like that, you never find out, right? And I think it's very normal. It's a, everyone out there who have built a success story or is successful today had a bad time. Just a very few who's maybe had a not, but generally they have always come in from tough backgrounds. Usually the, the very wealthy backgroundish kids, they don't make it. They just stay in the family and women who work there. They're fine, secure. They will be always spending money of the family, not their own, right? Kind of security. But the ones who really get out and do their own, they become very successful. Yeah, and maybe you appreciate it also differently when you have been through the tough times. Oh, 100%, 100%. You appreciate every day. You, you know, I'm very, you know, the attitude is very important and mentality you have in life. And that's why I believe I get blessed or new doors open because I share. You know, I share with others. I make others better. I help them, you know. And so I think that's the one thing I had always inside me. Teaching, again, it comes back to teaching. Making someone else's life better makes my life better. You have this drive. I can, you know, you hear it, you see it, you feel it. And just what you said in the beginning that Your parents said you could be a lawyer and a doctor, and uh, technically you became both, right? Since you have a PhD, so <laughs> yes, of course. I said, okay, I need to make my parents happy. So because I can't make them unhappy, I need to find a way where they're happy and I'm happy. My dad can say my son is a lawyer; he's happy, and I can say I'm a teacher at university. Maybe it was a good thing. Otherwise, I'll be a teacher at primary school today. Who knows? 
Approaching the end here, is there something that I haven't asked you that you feel you want to bring up? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I think we talked a lot, quite a lot. I think uh, I don't want to bore the listeners as well. I don't <laughs> think they are bored at all. Uh, Give them uh, with a good uh, final impression. I think. Uh, yeah, I think the most important thing. It's about you know when you believe something in your life that you can achieve certain things you should go for it without listening to anyone around you especially with negative influence which i cut very short in my life. like i don't have any negative people around me any i don't like them i don't like friends with negativity when i say i want to do this oh you know what that's maybe you can't do it get away with them so i w- I'll always have surround myself with positive people who have a positive impact on my life and who believe in me so I hate people which are always negative, always seeing things from a bad side, you know. This negativity creates negativity for you as well. So surround yourself with friends, you know, or with family members who help you, who believe in you, because that's what you need, especially when you're young and when you're pursuing, you know, I know so many agents, young or wannabe agents, they don't even, tr- they don't even, uh, they don't even say it. I want to be an agent because they don't, be- it's too much for them in terms of, what what would my friends say when I say I want to become an agent? Like they would, you know, they would laugh about me. And to them, I just can say, just don't talk to them. You know, just don't surround yourself with these people who will drag you down, you know, because that's important. You know, you need support. We all need support in life. All of us, no one is alone there, right? And we needed support from family, good friends, could be girlfriend, could be wife, whatever is there, you know, you need that. You need the support back, you know, backing, and I think uh, that's important for all of us. So surround yourself with the right people and believe always in self and never think about what other people believe. And don't see it as a problem, whatever's out there. So that's also one thing I tell the students a lot. They come sometimes to my talks. I have a Zoom call, Eric, I have so many problems. And I said, look, you will never become someone. Already your approach is so wrong. Like I have problems, problems. You wake up and you problem, right? They see it as an opportunity. Why don't you call a problem an opportunity? Then it's a positive. Because if you overcome it, you you achieve something, right? It's a positive. It's the way we see things. It's very important. We need to give them the belief in themselves and say, don't see things. Don't call it even a problem. If you call something a problem, it's negative. And that influences the way you're thinking and your whole day and your life. If there's something happening, say, that's an opportunity for me to overcome. And then suddenly that becomes a positive and we are approaching it with a positive mind and we can overcome it and we are healthy, a healthy mind, healthy work and everything else. So I'll try to, you know, shift the way of thinking. And it's very important to mentality for the young ones out there. You know, don't see it as a problem, see it as an opportunity. That's fantastic. I think that's uh, great advice. The final question that I ask everyone is if you could choose the next guest on this podcast, who do you think that I should talk to? The next guest on the podcast, um, I don't know if you know Misha Sher. No. Have you heard his name? No. So Misha Sher is definitely someone I would uh, recommend you. I mean, you have already talked to Daniel G. Uh, but the other one, I would say, uh, right, you know, same category uh, is Misha Sher. Misha is from uh, United States, but lives in London. He's born, raised actually in Ukraine. And then as a kid, they go to America. But he should tell the story, not me too much. But eventually, he's now head of Mediacom Sports, right? It's the biggest media company in the world, right? Uh, it's under the WPP uh, umbrella. And Misha is someone who went down, who went from all the stages up to the top. He's leading the group at Mediacom in London and head of global sports. He looks after the marketing of players like uh, Vinicius at Real Madrid and a lot of others. Uh, he's a marketing branding. He works with athletes. He done for Ozil a lot of things. Helped us with commercial deals. He's a commercial guy, off the pitch things. Uh, someone I take a lot of advice and listen a lot to. Young from ages, of, I think we're same age. Like uh, we are both twenty seven. <laughs> <laughs> I let it stay like this. There twenty seven. I wish. So yeah, you should definitely talk to Misha Shea. I'm happy to make an introduction with Misha. It's a great story, great story, hardworking guy. And um, he will still go to the, you know, uh, to different places in the world. Uh, yeah, fantastic guy. You should talk. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Eric, it's so good 
thank you so much for being on the Sports Management Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me and good luck with the future and all the best, Marcus. Thank you for listening to the Sports Management Podcast. Please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment about what you thought about this episode. If you want to get in contact with me, send an email to sportsmpodcast at gmail.com or hit me up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at sportsmpodcast.